everybody, Karen here. So are you ready? Because it is finally time for the Paint 101 video. This is part of my Craft Supplies 101 video series. Previously I've done paper, glue, tape, scissors, cutting tools. Is that it? That might be it. You guys really seem to like them, so settle in because this is going to be a very long video. Let's talk paint. Actually, before I get into the different types of paint, I first want to talk about paint series. On a whole bunch of different types of paints like oil paints, watercolors, some acrylics, gouache, um, you'll see on the label that it says series one or series three or whatever number it is. Basically, the higher the number, the more expensive the paint is going to be. Sometimes it's because the paint quality does increase, but often it's just because some pigments are harder to produce than others. For example, yellow ochre will usually be a series one across most paint brands because that's just a very easy pigment to produce, whereas cobalt blue might be a series four and and thus more expensive because it's a more expensive pigment for the company to make. Either way, the higher the series number, the more expensive the paint. So if you're just starting out, definitely just look for series one or two paints because they're the cheapest. And then once you're a serious painter, then you can start deciding if you want to be investing $60 into a single tube of paint. Okay, and then another distinction is artists or professional paint versus student paint. Student paints are lower quality and use man-made formulas rather than pure pigments. Whereas artists or professional paints are more archival and use higher quality pigments and generally are also more expensive. However, when you mix the colors, they stay a lot more vibrant if you're using artists or professional paint, as you can see in this video that Blick Art Supplies made, and I'll link the entire video down below. So another thing to keep in mind when trying to keep colors vibrant is whether it's a pure pigment or a hue. Basically, look at the back of the tube, and if the ingredients just show one pigment, then it is a pure color. However, over the years, some pigments that painters used to use have been found to be toxic. So, to still be able to sell those colors and to be able to sell a broader range of colors, you can also get paints that are a mixture of multiple pigments. And on the back in the ingredients list, you'll see multiple pigments listed. It's often called something like Naples Yellow Hue. If you see hue, in the name, that means that it's a mixture of pigments. Basically, if you're mixing hues rather than pure colors, it'll get muddier a little bit faster because it says if you're mixing six pigments rather than two pigments if your hues have three in each. But if you want to keep using the same color over and over for multiple paintings without having to remix it each time, there's nothing wrong with using hues. It just depends on what colors you need and how often you'll need them for the projects that you're working on. If you want more information, about this, I found a really good article on EmptyEasel.com, so I'm going to link that right down below. Okay, now let's finally get into the different types of paint, starting with acrylic paint. So the Wikipedia page for acrylic paint says that it is pigment suspension in acrylic polymer emulsion which is probably true, but I don't really know what that means. Basically, it is just a fast-drying, all-purpose craft paint. It's water-based as opposed to oil paints, which are obviously oil-based. I've been using the Basics acrylic paint for years and years now, and it is just great for all around crafting and painting, especially if you're a beginner. So acrylic paint is water soluble, which means that you can mix it with water in order to get more watercolor effects. And most acrylic paint dries very fast and has a semi-matte or a satin finish. So in terms of the different types of acrylic paint, you can get heavy body paint. It's best for heavy paint application because it's a really thick paint. It should be able to hold a stiff peak, and it's great if you're doing like really textured paintings or if you just need a very heavy paint application. On the other hand, fluid or soft body paint is a much thinner paint. They work great for watercolor techniques or when you need a really smooth coverage. Moving on, let's talk about tempura paint. This is kind of a tricky one because true tempura paint is one of the oldest painting methods used. It was the primary painting method until the 1500s when oil paint was invented. So it's made of pigments mixed with a binding agent like 
like egg, water, honey, glue. You can actually make your own egg tempera paint by just mixing pigments with egg yolks. There are a ton of tutorials online if you want to try it out for yourself. However, the tempera paint you might be more familiar with is the inexpensive paint often sold in huge jugs for kids to use. It's usually non-toxic and this is what you would give elementary school kids because it is so so cheap for how much you get. This isn't true egg tempera paint since if you make that with real egg yolks it'll spoil the same way that eggs would. Rather it's all synthetic pigments and cheap binding agents to just make some inexpensive paint. Now pretty much every single time I see a DIY project that calls for a tempera paint there's somebody asking if you can use acrylic instead. While both paints are water-based acrylic paint uses an elastic binding method called gum arabic which tempera paint doesn't. So tempura dries a little chalkier while acrylic dries a little more glossy. And they might be interchangeable for some projects, I don't want to speak for everything, but one where they're not is Sea Lemon's DIY scratch art, which she did on HGTV Handmade. And so she put black tempura paint over a colorful base and so you can scratch it off and that would not work with acrylic paint. Now let's talk about gesso. Um, I have a really little bottle of it because I didn't want to spend a lot of money, but you can also get it in huge jugs. So it looks like way paint but it's actually meant to be used to prepare canvas for painting on later. It's traditionally made of rabbit skin glue, chalk, and white pigment, although now you can also get gray and black gesso depending on what type of surface you're preparing. It's meant to be applied in several very very thin layers, although now a lot of canvases are sold pre-primed so you don't even have to worry about it. Moving on, let's tackle oil paint. To be honest, oil paint has always been kind of a mystery to me. I've never taken any like advanced painting classes, so I've only ever used acrylic for painting on a canvas, and the fact that oil paint can be really toxic and the price just kind of always made me a little wary of it. But for a brief overview, oil paint consists of pigments suspended in linseed oil. It is super slow drying, which is important because that means you can work on the painting for a long period of time and you can make corrections and you don't just have a canvas of dried paint like you would with acrylic. The viscosity of the paint can be changed by adding turpentine so if you use thinner paint then you can build up more layers and you can get really amazing color depth with oil paint. Most of the most famous paintings from the 1500s on were done in oils. So just like I mentioned before oil paints are often sold in different series and they can very quickly become very expensive. If you're just starting out, don't feel like you need to spend $60 on each tube of paint. And if you are spending $60 on each tube of paint, you probably know way more about oil painting than I do. And then really quick, just on brushes for oil painting, I think I'm going to do another video just about brushes, but a quick rule of thumb is that acrylic brushes are usable for oil paints, but brushes made specifically for oil painting, like Fitch or Sable brushes, they really shouldn't be used with acrylics. Okay, so that was a very, very, very brief overview of oil paint. But if you want to learn more, Blick Art Supplies has a really good FAQ, which I'm going to link down below. I also found a channel called Simple Art Tips, and she should have way more subscribers than she does. She has a great video about kind of an intro to oil painting, and also videos about tons of other art techniques. So I'll link her channel down below as well. Alright, now let's talk about watercolors. They usually come either in a pan or in tubes. As you probably already know, watercolors need to be mixed with water in order to be able to be used, and the amount of water that you use determines how opaque or how transparent they're going to end up. You definitely always want to use watercolors on watercolor paper, because that paper isn't going to warp from all of the moisture that you're putting on it. One thing to note, there is no opaque white watercolor. Once you've put down colors on the paper and they've dried, you can't really take them off again. So some painters will use resists like artist tape or clear wax on the parts of the papers that they they want to keep white. So in terms of technique, you can use watercolors to make washes, which is where you apply a lot of color all at once, often used to make backgrounds. Or you can make a glaze where you layer colors on top of each other to get various color effects. You can paint wet in wet, which is where you apply paint to wet paper in order to get 
get kind of soft, blurry shapes. Or you can use a dry brush technique where you apply the paint to dry paper in order to get really crisp lines and details. So next, something that can often be confused with watercolors is gouache. With gouache, you also mix water with the paint in order to use it, but it's meant to be an opaque paint. It dries super matte and the pigment is so pure that it's often used in color theory classes to make color swatches. And you can also use white gouache with watercolors if you want to fix mistakes or paint over some areas to add some white back in. So moving on to spray paint. This is a paint that comes in a pressurized container and is released in a very fine mist. It leaves a smooth, evenly coated surface with no brush marks. Make sure that you only ever use spray paint outside and that you put down a tarp or something underneath so that you don't get paint all over the ground. And also make sure that you shake the can well so that you can hear the ball rattling around inside before you use it. So the best technique with spray paint is to do several light coats rather than one heavy coat because that can lead to drips in the paint. So the upside to spray paint is that it is super fast to paint a large area. Unfortunately, you can't mix colors, so you need a different can of spray paint for each color that you want to use. So since the spray has a fuzzy edge, you can very easily make gradients. So similarly, we've got airbrushing. This isn't a technique that I've ever personally used, but it involves kind of spraying paint through a contraption like this one using air pressure. This allows for seamless gradients and color blending. It's often used to make illustrations, murals, makeup, temporary tattoos, adding designs to t-shirts, adding graphics to cars. There are so many uses out there. So one that I'm a little more familiar with is fabric paint. As you would guess, it is made specifically for painting on fabric. It's great for kids craft projects, although make sure that you only get it on the clothing that you want to put it on because most fabric paints are machine washable. So once you get it on the fabric, it's not coming out. So how is it different from just normal acrylic paint? Once you paint it on the fabric and it dries, it's more flexible. Though keep in mind, if you're painting a large area with fabric paint, it's still going to be fairly stiff just because it's sitting on top of the fabric and not getting absorbed into it like fabric dye would. So a lot of fabric paints are pretty thick and they stay 3D when they dry. To get this effect, you'll want to look for either dimensional paint or puffy paint. But if you don't want to buy specific fabric paint, you can also get fabric paint mediums, which you just mix with acrylic paint and it turns your acrylic paint into fabric paint. Now, I couldn't make this video without talking about gilding paint, which I use in like every single DIY. It's also called liquid gold leaf, although you can get it in lots of different metallic colors, not just gold. Make sure that you shake it well before using. It is super, super opaque, so you should only need one coat, but make sure that you use it in a very well-ventilated room because there are a whole lot of chemicals in here that you probably don't want to be breathing. So if you want to learn more about it, I actually made a video last year with a ton of DIYs using gilding paint. I'll link that right down below. All right, now let's talk about chalk paint and chalkboard paint. Chalk paint has a very matte finish, and you generally don't need to do any prep work before applying it, like painting with a primer or sanding down the furniture, it can just go right on. You can make your own chalk paint by mixing latex paint with plaster of Paris, and it is often used on wood or metal furniture and then sanded down to get kind of a rustic vintage look. On the other hand, chalkboard paint is the one that you can write on with chalk, like a chalkboard. It comes in tons of colors now, not just black, and you can actually make your own by mixing latex paint with grout. Or if you just want to buy it, you can get it as either a spray paint or a roll-on paint. Generally, you'll want to make sure that you prime the paint before writing on it with chalk. Wait until it's dry, then apply a layer of chalk and wipe it off. And this way, the first thing that you draw on the chalk won't stay there. It's kind of a ghosty shadow forever. Next, I want to talk about house paint, which is not my area of expertise. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than I can tell you in this video, but generally it'll come in big containers. You can paint an entire room. You can also get samples like this for pretty cheap, which are great for painting furniture or just kind of sampling the color. If you are going to be painting a room, make sure you start with primer, which is usually white and is used to prime the wall before painting on top of it. Just make sure that you get a primer that matches your paint, so don't get a water-based primer for an oil-based paint and vice versa. So you can get interior paints or exterior paints, which is pretty self-explanatory, but usually you'll want to use water-based paint inside and oil-based paint outside. Also, you 
you can usually pick up paint swatches for free at a hardware store, which um, one, are great for picking a paint color for decorating a room, but also are great for craft projects. But if you are going to be painting a room, please do your own research, go to a hardware store, talk to the person in the paint section, because I am not an expert. Oh my god, we're almost done. So speaking of exterior paints, patio paint is a type of acrylic paint, but it's meant to be able to survive outside. In theory, it's supposed to be able to withstand whatever weather you throw at it. However, if you are currently under a blizzard like the East Coast is, um, you know, maybe bring some of your stuff inside. Anyway, it is thinner than normal acrylic paint, and it also dries with a little more of a matte finish. This is great for painting things like flower pots or outdoor furniture, which are gonna live outside. Now, enamel paint is an oil-based paint that dries to a hard, glossy finish. It's often used for outdoor surfaces or industrial, things that go through a whole lot of wear and tear. For a more crafty use though, it's often used on model airplanes and you can get teeny tiny little containers of it for just a few dollars. And finally, glass paint is meant to be used on glass and is transparent so light can shine through the color. This one that I found online is dishwasher, microwave, and oven safe, but definitely check the packaging of whatever you get and don't take that as universal. Some glass paints will need a surface conditioner applied before the paint, so again, check the packaging of whatever it is that you buy. And again, Blick Art Supplies has a really good overview, so I'll link that page right down below. All right, everyone take a deep breath. That was a lot. I hope I didn't forget any types of paint. Please let me know in a comment if I did or if I got anything wrong. So I would love to know what video you guys want to see next. I am definitely planning a video about the different types of paint brushes and how to take care of them. Maybe one about rulers, maybe one about um, like drawing pencils. Let me know what you guys want to see. So I am not going to be doing a giveaway in this video since most of what I showed were just my own personal paint collection. But stay tuned because I am definitely going to be having more giveaways coming up in the future. Be sure to check out all the other Craft Supply 101 videos in just a minute. And subscribe for a new video every Friday. And I will see you guys next Friday for a new episode of Critique O'Clock. Alright, go get back to your lives. Thank you for watching. Bye everybody!